Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone tuning in from around the world. Thank you for joining us for this exciting event entitled Antarctica, U.S. Research and Diplomacy on the Southern Continent. My name is Marisol Maddox, and I'm an analyst at the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. I'm honored to introduce today's event, but first want to give a special thanks to Michaela Stiff, the Polar Institute's program assistant who's provided behind the scenes support to make this event happen. The United States is one of 12 original signatories to the Antarctic Treaty and has a long history of interest in the region, which will be discussed by David Bolton, a senior fellow at the Wilson Center's Polar Institute and the former US ambassador for oceans and fisheries at the US Department of State. We are additionally fortunate to be joined by Dr. Kelly Faulkner, Director of the Office of Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation, who also serves as Director of the U.S. Antarctic Program. Dr. Faulkner will give an overview of U.S. leadership in Antarctica and the vast array of ways in which we engage in the region. This year marks 200 years since humans discovered Antarctica. It seems fitting that the place that had for so long been referred to as the unknown southern land would end up being a critical location for exploration of some of the ultimate unknowns regarding our fundamental understandings of the nature of our universe and deep space. One of the pioneers of the astrophysics research that explores these profound questions is one of our other panelists, Dr. John Carlstrom of the University of Chicago. And finally, we are privileged to be joined by Captain William Wojtyla, the commanding officer of our nation's sole heavy icebreaker, the Polar Star, which typically deploys south each year in support of Operation Deep Freeze, which resupplies U.S. Antarctic stations. This year, they are displaying their operational agility by pivoting north for the first time since 1982 in support of Coast Guard's Arctic strategy. Our moderator for this session will be Dr. Mike Sfrega, the direct, director of the Wilson Center's Polar Institute and the Global Risk and Resiliency Program. Antarctica is truly a place where the United States is a leader. So I am so excited today to showcase the diversity of our interests as represented by each of our esteemed panelists. Any questions that you would like to ask the panel can be sent to our email, which is polar at wilsoncenter.org or through our Twitter account, which is uh, at Polar Institute. And now I will hand the program over to Dr. Sraga to get us started. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marisol. And thank you for bringing forward the idea of this program to all of us and for shaping today's events. We have nearly 600 of our colleagues registered and listening to us today. And I'm pleased to know that there's a high degree of interest in US research and diplomacy in the Antarctic. And it reaffirms the Institute's decision to increase in 2021 our programming and scholarship on this region. Many of you have asked, so I will follow up and let you know that you can find past events related to the Antarctic on our website, including the first edition of our new publication, Polar Perspectives. The first piece was authored by Global Fellow Peter Carey entitled, Is It Time for a Paradigm Shift in How Antarctic Tourism is Controlled? I'd also like to uh, bring to your attention a new publication by our colleague Anders Beal of the Latin American program. That new publication is available on our website and also the website of the Latin American program, and it's entitled The White Continent and South America, Climate Change, Global Policy, and the Future of Scientific Cooperation in Antarctica. I'd also like to thank our partners for today's program, our Latin American program at the Wilson Center, the China Environmental Forum, the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Coast Guard, and a special thank you to the crew of the U.S. Coast Guard cutter, Polar Star. And as always, our sponsors, A2A Railway and Oguna Corporation. We simply could not do our work without their support. And as Marisol noted, we would encourage you to go to polar at wilsoncenter.org to send in your questions, or you can find our Twitter account and ask us questions there. With that brief introduction, it's an honor to now introduce Ambassador David Bolton to begin today's program. Dave. Thanks very much, Mike. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, today. Uh, my job in uh, seven or eight minutes is to give a very brief 
overview of um, Antarctica itself and uh, the sort of the diplomatic issues associated with this fascinating continent. Um, hmm. There we go. Um, it is a big place. Uh, here you see a map of the United States superimposed over the continent of Antarctica. You can see it's uh, Antarctica is rather rather larger. It's not. It's about 5.4 million square miles, larger than the U.S. Uh, it has a total coastline of some 18,000 miles. It is obviously the coldest continent, but also the driest, the highest, and the windiest. And in the austral winter, as the sea ice expands. The size of the continent roughly doubles. Um, there's a lot more amazing stuff to say about the geography of Antarctica. But I think I'll just turn at least as briefly to the history. As Marisol said, we are um, at the 200th anniversary of the first sighting of the continent. Lantos, an expedition, a Russian expedition led by a guy named Bellinghausen in January 1820. We're also a little more than a century away from the time the first humans reached the South Pole, Roald Amundsen and his team in December 2011 and Robert Falcon Scott. About a month later, some of Scott and some of his men died on the, on the journey. Uh, they were propelled not only by, you know, hopes of personal glory and national interest, but also by science and that uh, impulse uh, to discover, explore, learn about this uh, part of our planet certainly has uh, continued and motivates a lot of what goes on in Antarctica through today. today. In the 1950s, it also brought about the first uh, international geophysical year, 1957-58, that brought a lot of it, more attention to Antarctica. And during that time, the Cold War was underway, and a number of countries in the region had claimed for themselves portions of the Antarctic continent. And here you see a map, it's kind of a busy map, showing uh, the overlapping land claims by seven different countries. Those are alphabetically Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom. The United States and the Soviet Union, now the Russian Federation, maintain what we call a basis of a claim, but have not actually asserted a claim to the continent. Um, but these competing claims and the ongoing Cold War prompted concerns that Antarctica could become a scene of geopolitical conflict. And in uh, one of the far reaching decisions of the 1950s, somewhat surprisingly in some ways, uh, the United States and Soviet Union and a number of other countries involved decided not to allow that to happen. Instead, they developed, negotiated and signed the Antarctic Treaty, there you see a picture of being signed right here in Washington, D.C. in 1959. Um, it entered into force in, in uh, 1961, with, as Marisol said, 12 original parties. Today, there are 54 parties to the treaty, 29 of whom have so-called consultative status, meaning they maintain active science programs. It gives them some greater uh, decision-making authority under the treaty regime. The treaty covers all areas south of 60 degrees south latitude. That's not just the continent, but a large swath of the ocean space north of the continent. And it's generally considered one of the most successful treaties ever negotiated. Um, there's a lot written about the treaty. Here are the basic elements. Those claims I mentioned, they are held in abeyance. Um, the they're, they're not eliminated, but those seven countries are not under the treaty allowed to uh, advance or augment their claims. No new claims may be made. Um, the treaty also reserves the continent for peaceful purposes. No military activities or ins installations permitted. The military can provide some logistical support for other activities, but no military activities as such. The treaty guarantees the freedom of scientific investigation and says that scientific information must be exchanged, prohibits nuclear explosions and the disposal of nuclear waste. And decisions under the treaty, which are mostly made every year in uh, annual meetings, so-called Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings, are done by consensus, which sometimes a strength, sometimes perceived as a weakness of this, sometimes I must say many other regimes. And the treaty permits each party to inspect 
installations, scientific stations of others. I'll talk more about that in a moment. The original treaty has, uh, is now part of a larger system of treaties. Uh, and here are the other components of that, the protocol on environmental protection, the convention, convention on the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources, Another treaty, not much talked about, Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Seals. And then the measures, many of which are binding, that the parties uh, take and bring into force under these various regimes. I'll talk about each of these very briefly. The um, Antarctic Environmental Program, uh, Protocol, the Madrid Protocol, came into force in the late 90s. Uh, among other things, it prohibits mining in Antarctica, and in so doing, in so doing, actually supersedes another regime that had been negotiated that would have allowed some mining to take place under strict circumstances and regulations. Instead, the parties decided not to allow mining in Antarctica. The protocol also requires environmental impact assessments, and requires uh, management of waste, both on land and in the ocean, and creates a committee on environmental protection that makes recommendations for measures. Camelar as the vehicle through which the countries manage the ecosystems, the waters surrounding Antarctica, uh, manages the, promotes and facilitates marine scientific research in this area, manages the fisheries that take place in the Southern Ocean, and of late has been the vehicle for uh, developing and bringing into force marine protected areas, including the largest marine protected area in the world, the Ross Sea MPA, a map, map of which you can see on this slide. I mentioned um, inspections. Yeah, this was a critical part of uh, the original treaty. The idea was, uh, there are a number of ideas. One was to uh, ensure that the prohibition on military activities was uh, abided by. So each party has the right to show up unannounced at any facility of any other party, including scientific research stations, and see what's going on there. In fact, the United States has tended to do these inspections roughly every five years. Uh, in 2012, there was um, an historic joint US-Russia inspection. You can see a picture of the two teams there on the, the right and uh, the seal of the joint inspection uh, team there as well. The most recent inspection uh, earlier in this calendar year, prior to the pandemic, uh, you can see a picture up there uh, on the upper left in the screen and uh, Captain Wartiero was actually a member of that inspection. These days, I think the inspection teams are not primarily looking for violations of the uh, prohibition on military activities, but actually compliance with the environmental rules that have been put in place. The main US policy priorities, other, may, other people may talk to this, here they are, and they haven't really changed appreciably over time, maintaining peace and security, promoting science, protecting the environment, ensuring safety, managing uh, fish and other marine resources sustainably. And at least before the pandemic, managing tourism was a big part of what the, was done through the Antarctic Treaty. Tourism is rather down these days, but presumably will rebound at some point and the need for further management of it will resume. Well, that's once over very lightly. I actually made it to the South Pole once myself, me and my little lion. And there you see us there a little more than a decade ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. That was a, a, lot of, a lot of ground to cover literally and figuratively in a very short period of time. We'll have time to loop back around. I, I of course, have, have a couple of questions, but thank you very much for setting the stage perfectly uh, for Dr. John Carlstrom. Uh, John, thank you very much for joining us. Let me turn it over to you. I think Dave set the nice diplomatic a landscape for us, but also set the stage for this continent of science. And when perhaps nowadays we think about the continent of science, our, our eyes and ears go toward climate change, but you bring about a, a, a rather Maybe interesting Mike, perspective, and that is... Hey, Mike, I think Kelly you. might be next. Say that again, Dave. I think Kelly is actually next. Okay, well, we'll... This is this is calling audibles. We're going to go to Kelly next. Dave set the perfect context, Kelly, for this this science, this continent of of, of research and diplomacy. Uh, and and nowadays we think about climate change almost perhaps solely, at least from the public perspective, and maybe from the policy perspective. But what NSF supports is so much more than that. 
uh, and I really appreciate you joining us. So I wanna turn it over to you to talk about the National Science Foundation's efforts in Antarctica uh, across a broad spectrum of efforts. Thank you, Kelly, for joining us. Sure, and I do look forward to John's comments momentarily. Dave, could you stop sharing your screen and I'll, I'll share mine. Thank you. Uh, my slides showing up there, everybody? Good, all right, thanks. All right, first of all, I wanna thank the Wilson Center for this opportunity to showcase the US Antarctic program or the USAP as I'll call it for short. And thank you, Ambassador Bolton for setting the important policy context in which the USAP functions. And I'd like to start by elaborating a little bit more on how science came to dominate our activities in Antarctica. So following the heroic era of Scott and Shackleton uh, that was just mentioned, the US ushered in an entirely new era of exploration in the early decades of the 1900s by exploiting new technologies and logistics capabilities. So US Navy Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd led forays to Antarctica that included the first overflight of South Pole in 1929, as well as occupying a series of research stations that he called Little Americas. And public interest in Antarctica at the time rivaled the fascination with the Apollo moon landings 40 years later. So in 1946, Byrd organized an unprecedented Antarctic expedition called Operation High Jump. And that took advantage of available military capabilities to conduct continent-wide aerial photography of Antarctica for the first time. The photo on the left is a bird dropping US flags at the pole during high jump. In many ways, the scale of this activity in Antarctica exceeded anything ever done before or since. 4,700 naval and marine personnel participated via 13 ships, including an aircraft carrier and a submarine. 19 fixed wing aircraft and four helicopters. And that was followed the next year by the slightly smaller Operation Windmill that acquired ground truth information with which to calibrate and interpret the photos. And on the Waddell Sea side of the continent, Norwegian born American citizen, Captain Finrani accomplished 3,600 miles of exploration by ski and dog sled in that same time frame. So those activities set the US up as a leading participant in the subsequent 1957-58 International Geophysical Year that uh, Ambassador Bolton just mentioned. And for this, scientists from 67 countries joined forces to intensify geophysical observations around the planet with an emphasis on Antarctica and for the first time in space. And you may recall that this was the time when Sputnik, the satellite that's depicted in the top middle image here, was launched by the Soviet Union and created some urgency toward enhancing our nation's science capabilities. And the US National Academies were responsible for planning our Antarctic science program. And then they drew in the nascent uh, National Science Foundation to manage the budget and other matters. Paul Seipel, who's pictured on the uh, right in this photograph, who participated as a Boy Scout in one of Admiral Byrd's first Antarctic ventures, was the civilian who was charged with establishing a science program at the inaugural South Pole Station that was constructed by members of the Navy's Construction Battalion, or CBs, during the IGY. And as you'll see in a moment, the US has upgraded South Pole Station with newer facilities since then. So this international cooperation during the IGY led to the treaty, as was just described. And the National Science Foundation has carried forward the management of the US Antarctic Research Program ever since. So in order to exert the strongest form of leadership under the treaty system, it's vital not only that the US have an active scientific presence in Antarctica, but also an influential one. And toward that end, NSF views it vitally important to maintain the USAP as the world leading Antarctic research program. And as one measure to ensure optimal investments, we support scientific research that is best done or can only be done in or on Antarctica. Furthermore, staying at the forefront of science requires us to be poised to respond to the best emergent science ideas and to push ourselves to do things we haven't done before. 
So the challenges of the Antarctic environment are such that we always need flexibility and excellent contingency planning to ensure safe operational support. And we're certainly drawing on that experience and mindset now to keep COVID-19 out of Antarctica and yet keep the program going, albeit at somewhat reduced activity levels. So a presidential memorandum dating back to the 1980s and subsequently reaffirmed requires NSF to operate three year round stations on the Antarctic continent. So from top to bottom, the arrows point to Palmer Station on the peninsula, Edmondson Scott South Pole Station and McMurdo Station on Ross Island. And on this map, you also see the locations of about 80 other stations of other nations scattered around the continent. About 30 of these are operated on a year round basis with the rest being seasonal. It might look a little crowded on this map, but the 80 stations are spread out over an area one and a half times the US. And so generally the stations are very remote from each other. So while focused on the single continent, the US Antarctic program, as you can see, is a global enterprise. This graphic shows our two main supply routes for our stations that stretch over 10,000 miles each. NSF headquarters are in Alexandria, Virginia. Those of our prime support contractor Lidos are near Denver, Colorado, and we consolidate shipping at Port Wainimi, California. And for Palmer Station, we generally transit supplies and people through Chile, and the final leg of the journey is made by ship across the Drake Passage as there's no runway at Palmer. The other main supply route is via Christchurch, New Zealand, as the stopping off spot for flights uh, to McMurdo Station. And from there, people typically would make the journey to Amundsen Scott South Pole Station via skied uh, C-130 cargo aircraft, weather permitting. So NSF is empowered to reach out to obtain support for the program from the private sector, other federal agencies, and the US military. And here you're looking at the range of aircraft assets that we enlist to make the program function. So beginning at the top right, uh, SCED C-130s known as, known as LC-130s are deployed from the 109th Airlift Wing of the New York Air National Guard. And down below it, the C-17 Airlift deploys from the 62nd Air Wing of Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington State. And we charter fixed wing and rotary aircraft from the private sector. You're going to hear shortly from uh, Captain Whitehera about the annual marine based resupply support. So I'm not going to belabor that now. So let's take a quick tour of our main stations. We'll start with Palmer Station on the Antarctic Peninsula. And it's a relatively small operation capable of housing of up to about 50 people. It's an excellent place uh, from which to base marine biological and bird research, among other things. And here you're looking at the dock and boat ramp that supports our small boat operations which allow us to go out to about a 25 mile radius range from the station these days. So, and as I mentioned, one gets to Palmer Station via ship from Punta Arenas, Chile, and the USAP currently charters two research vessels. So on the right is the Nathaniel B. Palmer, a 94 meter light ice breaking research vessel and the ship is a first rate platform for marine based studies, including biological, oceanographic, geological and geophysical research. It can operate safely year round in Antarctic waters that are often stormy or covered with sea ice. The smaller of the two vessels, the Lawrence M. Gold is a 76 meter ice strengthened vessel that supports research and resupply in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Now here you're looking at McMurdo Station uh, from the air in January of 2014. McMurdo was originally set up in expeditionary mode in 1956 and several structures meant to last for three to five years are still standing and in use over 60 years later. Others sprung up as the science became more sophisticated and needs arose. It has the feel of an old mining town. McMurdo offers tremendous advantages as our main logistics hub. <clears throat> and since we do intend to remain there for the foreseeable future, we've embarked on modernizing the station for efficiency and effectiveness. Now, in contrast to McMurdo, this is our very deliberately planned modern Amundsen Scott South Pole Station, which was formally commissioned in 2008. And it replaced the previous station structure that had become unsafe. 
anything you put on the surface at South Pole is quickly covered by blowing snow. The, this new station is chamfered or angled in the face of the prevailing wind in order to direct blowing snow away from it. And the station can also be jacked up on its legs to higher levels as the snow piles up. In fact, the snow has accumulated a whole, whole lot more than what's shown in this photo. And we are in fact making plans to jack the station up within the next few years. Now there's considerable infrastructure below the snow surface in addition to what you see. For example, a power plant, fuel storage, and water production are all subsurface. And that power production is very critical to facilities not in this picture that conduct that support the research that uh, Dr. Kallstrom will discuss shortly. Building something on this scale in this remote location took an immense amount of vision and engineering expertise as well as intensive logistics planning. And today everything needed to support the station such as fuel, scientific equipment, people and food comes through McMurdo via traverse vehicles or aircraft. And of course, we undertake all of this effort in support of the conduct of world-class science, uh, which we'll hear about in a moment. In my remaining time, what I'd like to do is just touch on a few examples of other areas of science that the program supports. So one advantage of South Pole is that it's located in the convergent zone of the flux lines of the Earth's magnetic field. So it's an excellent vantage point from which to study what we call space weather. You're already familiar with one manifestation of space weather as the Earth encounters the stream of charged particles emitted from our sun known as the solar wind. The upper atmosphere of the polar regions can react with a brilliant light show known as the auroras. Now we learned a lot about the auroras and the Earth's near space environment during the IGY. And that was purposefully timed to encompass a period of maximum sunspots and intense solar wind. And the associated interruption of radio signals made it particularly challenging to maintain communications during the IGY. Since that time, having built extensive electrical grids and become ever more reliant on satellites for navigation and communications, society is increasingly vulnerable to space weather events. So it is more important than ever before to address the many fundamental questions remaining about how the solar wind interacts with the Earth's magnetosphere and ionosphere. One of the best ways of learning about this is to make simultaneous observations north and south, as you can see in this photo. And the photo on the right is of one of six autonomous antenna stations being established along a thousand kilometer line in East Antarctica. That array complements an equivalent one that's in Greenland. So in addition to providing unprecedented ability to make real-time observations, we are also supporting studies about how the Earth's magnetic field has varied in the past by examining field direction and strength locked into certain rock minerals in Antarctica and elsewhere. We also make significant contributions from Antarctica to understand and predict the weather that affects you every day. So in partnership with NOAA, NASA, and the Europeans, we now routinely downlink satellite weather information in Antarctica and relay it in near real time for ingestion in operational models. So inclusion of the data downlink to McMurdo improved European regional forecasting by 45%. And it's credited for their successful projections of the trajectory and strength of Hurricane Sandy. NOAA uses the near real-time data in its global weather model that is the basis for aviation forecasting in the Southern Hemisphere. Transmission of weather data from McMurdo will become all the more important for the next generation of satellite sensors and models. And as world forecasting becomes ever more reliant on McMurdo, we're preparing new facilities to enable robust services well into the next several decades. And much like weather forecasting, we've upped our game in understanding the role of the Southern Ocean in our Earth system through the use of autonomous profiling floats like the one you see being launched here as part of the Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling Program or SOCOM for short. So these robotic floats house an innovative array of sensors that permit us to gain an unprecedented data coverage for the upper ocean that's changing our understanding of Southern Ocean circulation and productivity as well as the global carbon and heat cycling. In fact, this project proved so successful in the Southern Ocean that NSF has recently 
invested $50 million in extending this approach to our global oceans. Polar regions hold highly valuable records of our past climate in their ice sheets. Among other things, the gas composition of the atmosphere gets locked in bubbles as successive snow layers are compressed under their own weight and converted to ice. So in the second photo on the right, you're looking at a uh, thin section of the ice held by gloved fingers that reveals those gas bubbles. So there was a canonical ice core taken on the Antarctic plateau at Dome C that showed the CO2 contents of our atmosphere and temperatures go hand in hand over glacial and interglacial cycles for the last 800,000 years. So the exact nature of that relationship was a bit smeared in time given the resolution of that core. So the community quested after much higher resolution records. So what you're looking at in this photo is our efforts to uh, su support that quest at the West Antarctic Ice Sheet Divide. And here they were able to obtain a core that embodies 68,000 years of annually resolved data. Um, and we had to stand up advanced drilling capabilities for that. So that's what you're looking at in these photos. This more resolved record showed several episodes of abrupt change where CO2 and temperature rise quickly within an interval of one or two centuries and then level off in concert. And those abrupt changes are superimposed on more gradual millennial scale changes. And so the most likely explanation for these abrupt changes is they are paced by North Atlantic circulation. The longer scale changes appear linked to Southern Ocean circulation. So advances in understanding how the Southern Ocean and combined Arctic North Atlantic circulation affect our climate system continue to be of high priority. And of course, we need to weave together all the pieces of our Earth system in order to advance our ability to understand and predict climate change. As a result of sustained investment in ice sheet research, we've come to appreciate just how dynamic ice sheets are. Going back a few decades ago, the science community was documenting the fact that ice flow around the margin of the ice sheet seem to be concentrated in particular areas we now call ice streams. So on this map, ice streams show up as colored and have motions of up to three kilometers per year. And also illustrated on the map via red dots are the areas experiencing a net loss of ice to the sea. And the blue dots are areas where there's net land ice accumulation. And the dots are sized according to the magnitudes and the key shows down below the size of a 10 gigaton change. So for perspective on that, annual water consumption for New York City is about one and a half gigatons. The size of the ice sheet is a balance between gaining and losing ice. So several lines of evidence show that Antarctica is currently on net losing ice mass at about 100 gigaton per year. And that rate of loss is increasing. So how much is this? Well, one way to think about it is in terms of sea level rise. Sea level is currently rising at about three millimeters per year. And approximately a third of that is due to thermal expansion of warming seawater, a third to the loss of ice caps and glaciers, and one third due to the melting of Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Antarctic land ice loss is concentrated along the Edmondson seacoast, as you see there, and is currently responsible for about 7% of global sea level rise. As you can see on this map, the greatest losses are occurring in the West Antarctic ice sheet region, the Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers in particular. So what we think is going on there is that a layer of relatively warm subsurface water called circumpolar deep water is making its way up onto the shelves and melting the undersides of the floating ice shelves. And this comes about both as circulation and the temperature of the seawater are changing. So scientists have observed this by setting up year-round stations on the ice shelves that take continuous measurements at the ice ocean interface, as well as studying the seawater circulation and properties uh, of the cavity underneath the shelf with autonomous vehicles and watching from space and modeling these observations. So thus far, we have mounted a Pine Island Glacier Observation Program, and our current priority is on the larger Thwaites Glacier 
for which we've teamed up with our UK colleagues and others to spearhead an all out Mars Rover equivalent probe of that system. The science community is particularly concerned about the trends in the Amundsen Sea region because the base of the West Antarctic ice sheet sits below sea level and there's nothing to stop continual melting by the ocean as the floating ice shelves retreat back to their grounding lines. This map shows the bed elevation with the cooler colors below sea level and the warmer ones above. That Transantarctic mountain range separates the West Antarctic ice sheet from the East Antarctic ice sheet. There's approximately five meters of equivalent sea level rise tied up in the West Antarctic ice sheet and 60 on the East Antarctic ice sheet. So we don't currently think that the West Antarctic Antarctic ice sheet will melt within this century, but we do think it's very vulnerable. So the high priority that the science community places on the Thwaites Glacier is conditioned by the fact that if sea level rises by even one meter by 2100, as some project, 145 million people would be displaced and the lives of 2 billion people living in coastal areas around the world would be affected. Okay, so I've just skimmed the surface of the breadth and quality of our scientific endeavors. Uh, but before I pass the baton, I would like to give a shout out to the people from all walks of life who team together in Antarctica to make world leading science happen under extraordinary conditions. And particularly this year, their efforts and accomplishments should rightfully serve as a point of pride for all Americans. And two of the heroes of that are uh, going to follow my remarks right now. So it's time for me to pass the baton to Dr. Karlstrom. Thank you, Dr. Faulkner. Uh, I can't do any better than, than that, Dr. Karlstrom. So John, please uh, continue on. All right. Um, thank you all for uh, coming. Let me find my Material. Okay, you should see that. I see it, so I assume it works. So uh, Kelly uh, did this wonderful job telling you all about the science and world leading science, uh, uh, an expression we often use because it's so true. Um, but you might think, uh, why is this uh, cosmologist and astrophysicist uh, talking to you about the South Pole or Antarctica? And um, there is astrophysics from the South Pole is not a question. There is astrophysics from the South Pole, and it's really uh, phenomenal astrophysics. Um, and I'm going to give you a kind of a tour about that. And I think uh, we heard earlier that we used the when uh, David was talking, we used the the uh, Antarctic for doing science that can't be done elsewhere or is done best from the South Pole, and that certainly is is true here. So so yes, there's astrophysics, and it's amazing astrophysics. Um, I'll give you just a couple of examples, very high profile examples. Uh, but one is we are actually sitting there at the South Pole on two miles thick of ice. And some very smart people had realized that you could use, if you outfit that light, that ice and look for flashes of light, you could actually use it to detect neutrinos, these elusive particles that are passing through your body every second, passing right through the earth and going on and not affecting anything. They're so rarely interacting that you need a very, very big detector and maybe you could detect them. Uh, and so they outfitted the ice, this very ambitious project with 5,000 optical uh, detectors buried into the ice. And what they are looking for are very high energy neutrinos and opening up this field of neutrino astronomy, actually using neutrinos instead of light to study objects. And the objects they're sensitive to are the most violent collisions, accelerators, jets, and things in the universe. So uh, really amazing thing. And it's been enabled by the South Pole and of course, all the support from the uh, uh, NSF and the United States Antarctic Program. So this is called the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. And those little blips you see uh, superimposed looking on the light are these optical modules being detected. So the color is saying when, uh, when they get detected and the size is how big the detection is of light and they can trace then that they see these particles coming in. So maybe not an observatory that you're used to thinking about, 
but an extremely powerful one and one that is mapping the future and telling us uh, what is happening in the universe. Uh, what I do in my group and, and others and what is done extremely well from the South Pole is we actually study the universe by going back in time. We're looking at light from the very early universe. Now that light, uh, uh, how do you look at the early universe? Well, you look far away. Light doesn't get here instantaneously, travels at the speed of light, of course. Uh, so if you look farther and farther away, what you're seeing is farther and farther into the past. And so we're able to actually look uh, uh, not just at stars, not at galaxies, but actually we can look back to a time before stars formed. In fact, we can look back to a time before there were any stars, there were any galaxies, when atoms were just starting to form, the very first atoms. That's when the light was released from interacting with the plasma, that was the early universe, and we see that light, this 14 billion year old uh, fossil light from the Big Bang, which we call the cosmic microwave background. Now, microwave means kind of uh, a millimeter uh, or longer wavelengths. And you might say well, that's, that's light. Well, it is light. In fact, it is light that would have been light your eye could have seen, except it's been stretched out with the expansion of the universe as it uh, traversed the universe. And now it is at microwaves. So we do that from the pole. And what we want to do, I'm showing this picture here. This is from a, a NASA image. Uh, but we're looking back to when this universe was a plasma we're studying that with the hope and expectation uh, that not only can we tell what the universe was doing then, what it was made out of, what the basic constituents were, how it evolved from that state, but what even led to it being in that state to start with, what it was its origin. And so you see this glow uh, symbolized there of, uh, called inflation. And this is this theory that the whole observable universe that we see inflated from some incredibly small spot of space-time spec, much, much smaller than a, a nucleus, uh, uh, and inflated to about a millimeter, and then kept expanding to be our entire observable universe. We are looking at that, incredible energies. Energy is a trillion times higher than what you can look at uh, uh, with the particle accelerators on Earth. Um, and in this theory, if we can show that this is really true, we will have shown we have all arisen from quantum fluctuations. So. We're doing that from the South Pole. We also, using the geographical lo location of the South Pole, are part of a network of telescopes around the world called the Event Horizon Telescope. And we use these telescopes in unison. It's as if we're using the entire Earth as a single telescope, but only pieces of that telescope. Uh, we collect data, these various uh, places on Earth, including the South Pole with the South Pole Telescope, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, bring it all the central uh, processing uh, uh, location and make images of the data. So imagine uh, your eye, when you look out at the sky, you see uh, uh, stars and stuff, it's beautiful. And your angular resolution of your eye is a couple arc minutes. That's what it is. So look at anything and how it's the finest structure you can see. That's an angular resolution of a couple arc minutes. The beautiful images you see from the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, they show this incredible detail. That's about 6,000 times better. It's called a, a, a hundredth of an arc second. By combining these telescopes around the uh, Earth like this, we can make images where our angular resolution is another thousand times better, or a couple tens of a millionth of an arc second. And so with that, uh, to great acclaim in 2019, we were able to image the black hole at the center of a very powerful a galaxy called M87, a distant galaxy, very massive galaxy. The black hole has a mass of something like 6 billion times the mass of our sun. But now, in fact, we took the data then and we're still taking uh, data. We have trained uh, uh, the telescopes on the galactic center. That is the black hole at the center of our very own galaxy. The one that the uh, uh, Nobel Prize was given this year for people imaging the stars moving around it. We can image the, it, it, uh, that black hole as we did for M87. And the picture I show you on the right really points out the beauty of having a telescope at the South Pole for this. This is the view of the Earth as seen from the center of our galaxy. So you can see on the left, you see the South Pole telescope in the middle right at the South Pole and the other telescopes with the, the, the yellow uh, lines connecting them. And on the right, what happens after the Earth rotates a bit? And as you can see, uh, uh, and as you would 
guess, of course, is that you can always see the South Pole. We can see this no sources set or rise. They're always up from the South Pole. So, so it's a very, very important uh, location. And the length of those uh, lines tells you how high the angular resolution is. So you can see the lines going to the South Pole is what gives us that very high resolution. So we expect to have results out for everyone to see on what lies at the heart of our galaxy uh, in the next year. Uh, so why the South Pole? Uh, I've been kind of giving you those reasons as I go along, but it's extremely dry and stable atmosphere. Uh, you've heard uh, in even some of the earlier talks about the storms and the winds. Well, that's, those are at the coast, those are in the oceans. In the middle of the continent, it's actually very benign, very, very calm and stable atmosphere. The winds pick up as that air, cold, cold air, goes and heads towards the, uh, uh, towards the oceans. But in the middle of the continent, it's quite stable. And it's also extremely dry. Uh, the average temperature in the winter is about minus uh, 60 C or close to minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And at those temperatures, even if the, even if the atmosphere was saturated, uh, with humidity would be very, very little water. It just doesn't hold much water. So why do I care about water? Well, I wanna study uh, the universe using microwaves. And as you know, when you put your cup of coffee that got a little too cold in the microwave oven, uh, that the microwaves interact with water. So if we're studying microwaves and there's water vapor in the atmosphere, it clouds our signal, it adds noise. So we want to go to a very, very dry and very stable atmosphere stable because we're trying to make measurements of the early universe with a precision. If you look at one part of the sky to another part of the sky, you want to do that with a precision, uh, that accuracy of those differences of pushing a part in a billion. Uh, so incredibly, incredibly uh, accurate. So the South Pole is the best place to do that. I already mentioned that, of course, sources don't rise or set. We can observe and really drill down and really study a patch of the sky. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. The sun doesn't get very high. In fact, most of the, uh, of course, for overnight, six months overnight, it's out of the way completely. So it makes things very steady. And as I showed you with the ice cube uh, detector, having two miles of clear ice made into a neutrino detector uh, uh, really has opened up neutrino astronomy uh, and allows us to investigate the most extreme events in the universe through neutrinos. And of course, the excellent support, as Kelly and others have pointed out, by the United States Antarctic Program and the steady investments by the NSF uh, have really led to the South Pole astrophysics being world leading. Uh, it's fantastic. So let me just show you a few, few pictures. This is uh, a view from the station that Kelly showed you uh, behind you. This is looking out to what we call the dark sector. Uh, you can see the uh, 10 meter telescope. Uh, they are pointing away from you and you see these things that look like uh, upside down well upside up bowls uh, those are protecting these very sensitive smaller telescopes used as, uh, to measure uh, uh, degree angular scales in the sky all these are cosmic microwave background telescopes which are now working uh, together to try to probe the early universe and there's a picture again of a uh, lc 130 everything you see in this picture came uh, in in the back of one of those lc 130s piece by piece and then reassembled at the goal. Um, also, I'd just like to point out that the crews and the students and the, the learning uh, and training of, uh, of uh, graduate students, uh, what make these projects go. So this is uh, uh, the, for the South Pole Telescope, the crew that was down there last year, uh, putting a new receiver in. Um, and you can see they're both happy and delighted. These people uh, learn everything from big mechanical assemblies to uh, telescopes to huge uh, data processing, big data, and also to superconducting electronics and detectors, et cetera. It's really a wonderful opportunity uh, for science and also to train the next generation. This is a similar picture showing you now inside one of those uh, bowls, uh, uh, in this case, the bicep array with four of these smaller telescopes in it uh, and there happy crew having just uh, put in this new mount that you see behind you. Uh, you can see, actually I don't have enough time, but I, I'm tempted to keep going on and on about all the novel features we've had to figure out over the last few decades to actually operate through the winter where the observing is best. Uh, but uh, some of those features are, are seen here with 
having make sure you control everything in environmental uh, containers except where you look out. Um, this is a uh, another picture uh, in this case of the bicep array a crew with one of their cameras, uh, the focal plane. And so I want to point this out in that we're developing new superconducting detector technology. This particular uh, array of uh, a detector wafers, uh, there's many thousands of detectors in each one of those little squares there, uses these superconducting detectors. Uh, these happen to be made at JPL, uh, uh, where, where a lot of these people are still uh, involved with it, even though it's, we're using these super hyper clean rooms and professional staffs. Um, and they are cooled to operate so that our detectors are not adding noise. These things are cooled to operate at one quarter of a degree above absolute zero or minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. And this camera, and this is the one uh, here for the South Pole telescope with the crew very happily having got it all assembled before they put it in the telescope. These are the two largest uh, cameras of this type in the world. Uh, so we really are are at the cutting edge of technology as well as at the end of the world in studying the beginning of the universe. So this is an image uh, I, I hope many of you have seen. This is a from the Planck satellite of the cosmic microwave background as imaged uh, by that satellite. And uh, to you, it might look like noise uh, is meant to represent the whole 360 degrees around sky. Uh, uh, and what you're looking at though is the beginning of the universe, early universe, not the beginning, but early universe, 370,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, we <clears throat> at the South Pole and with other telescopes and with this data have been learning tons about the universe, what it's made out of. is only a, uh, we actually, only about 4% of the universe is stuff that you can find in the physics textbooks. The other is stuff we're still trying to figure out, dark matter and dark energy. But what we're really doing now at the South Pole with those telescopes I showed you, is we're drilling deep into a small part of this. And we're already a factor of uh, almost 10 times deeper or higher precision, but on a small part of this image. And with that, we are getting at this inflation. We're learning and looking for these small variations in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background, these small variations that will tell us what the universe was, whether these theories that the universe inflated from these small subnuclear speck of space time at these extremely high energies to give us everything in the observable universe today, whether those theories are right in the predictions, uh, 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 whether we can unify gravity with the other forces, looking for quantized gravity. We're doing all of that with these telescopes at the South Pole. Um, these are another view of the telescopes. Let me zoom in a bit, but just showing you the, the, the scenery. It's just a big plateau. Zooming in a bit, there's the South Pole telescope and those domes where the bicep uh, telescopes are. Uh, we want to get about a factor of 10 deeper than we have done. And so we are working for many years now on the next steps of the program, working with uh, NSF, working with our colleagues around the world. And what we want to put in and are planning and designing to do right now is called uh, um, the Next Generation Cosmic Microwave Experiment of CMBS4. It builds on what we have here, and I've kind of shown it schematically uh, here. And this would be combined also with some telescopes uh, in Chile for imaging uh, the rest of the sky on, the, on, on um, uh, not as deep, but doing other astrophysics as well. So that's uh, a very uh, brief uh, uh, overview of what we're doing. And I'll just leave you with a pretty uh, picture. Our, our telescopes under the aurora. John, John, thank you so much. And that, that entire presentation, but that photos, that's, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, and thank you for bringing us way back, but also giving a peek into the future. Uh, substantial research obviously being done and perhaps uh, you know, an area of research that many people just do not associate, A, do not associate with, with B, certainly perhaps do not associate with Antarctic research. I'm very pleased that you're able to bring us on this universal tour. Uh, let, let me now uh, complete the panel by inviting Captain uh, Bill Waitera to now uh, present his thoughts. And of course, he is the commanding officer of the US Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star, an essential component of supporting research and diplomacy in the Antarctic. Captain, please. Hey, Mike, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. 
Uh, Dave, Kelly, John, thank you for your presentations. And Marisol, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. I'm glad that I've got the chance to talk to you. Uh, today marks an interesting anniversary. It was actually 43 years ago today that Polar Star set sail from Seattle to go to Antarctica for the first time in uh, November of 1977. So as we've previously mentioned, the Coast Guard considers icebreaking and support of the US Antarctic program to be an enduring mission. We've been committed to this since the 1960s when an MOU with the US Navy transferred uh, the custody and operations of all the icebreakers in the US fleet to the Coast Guard. Polar Star has been carrying out this mission and the Coast Guard has been going to Antarctica nearly continuously with the exception of a few years about a decade ago to perform Operation Deep Freeze, to provide that logistical support, to provide the ice breaking and sea lift opportunity so that USAP can continue to lead this groundbreaking science that John shared with us. Polar Star was refit in 2013 and has conducted seven consecutive deep freeze deployments, which is a, a record for any ship associated with the Coast Guard or, or any other Antarctic program. We continue to go down there every year to provide that support, sea lift and logistics. Um, and we're committed to continuing to do this in the future. To that end, the Coast Guard has allocated $75 million to provide service life extension projects to Polar Star starting next summer. We're gonna enter a five-year multi-phase contract to make sure that Polar Star is able to meet operational commitments in Antarctica for the next decade. Following that, we're gonna see a new platform come online. The Polar Security Cutter is being acquired. The contract is, was awarded to VT Halter Marine almost two years ago. It's a $1.9 million investment that's gonna buy three new heavy icebreakers for the Coast Guard for the United States so that we can have continued access and presence in the Arctic and Antarctic for another generation. Construction on the Polar Security Cutter will actually start next spring uh, and will be online and delivered to the Coast Guard by 2024 and operational shortly thereafter. This is truly a state-of-the-art icebreaker and the requirements for that icebreaker were informed not only by the Arctic, but also USAP's requirements in the Antarctic because the Coast Guard is absolutely committed to providing those ice breaking services where they're needed for the US government, wherever that is worldwide. As Marisol alluded to, uh, we, we've had a bit of a change in plans and we're demonstrating a little agility this year. Polar Star will be deploying next month to go to the Arctic for an Arctic West winter deployment. This is the first time since 1982 that a Coast Guard icebreaker is gonna be north of the Arctic Circle in the winter. This is an opportunity for us to project sovereignty in the region during a time of year that we're not normally up there and fulfill the requirements and the lines of effort laid out in our Coast Guard Arctic Strategic Outlook. Specifically, we're enhancing our capabilities, both from a standpoint where we're investing in those platforms of the Arctic security cutters and polar security cutters to provide that presence in the future, but also in our human capital. We're doing training and we're building partnerships so that we'll be ready to operate that new fleet of vessels when they come online. The second line of effort for the Arctic strategic outlook is to strengthen the rules-based order in the Arctic. Uh, we're gonna go up there and we're going to wave the flag and we're gonna ensure that we're projecting sovereign presence and, and power into a region that is currently contested. We're seeing a lot of interesting activity up there that's different than we've seen in the past. And the Coast Guard's responsibility to maintain maritime safety, maritime security, and maritime stewardship is no less relevant in the Arctic than it is in any other sovereign US territory. We are doing all of that under an umbrella of national security. Uh, the Coast Guard as a military branch is going to project that power and sovereignty into the region. Lastly, the third line of effort from the Arctic strategic outlook is to innovate and adapt to promote resilience and uh, prosperity in the region. And we're certainly gonna do that. We're gonna take along some scientists with us. They're gonna be doing applied technology testing of communication systems and, and other gear to see what it's like and how it operates in that region 
any time of the year. So that's a brief outlook of, of, of where we're at, what we do and where we're going. And I'd love to take some questions from the floor or have the opportunity to uh, respond to your questions, Mike, or, or any other interactions with the rest of the panel. Thank you, Captain, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I should have mentioned on board the Polar Star here today, so thank you very much. Uh, we certainly do have questions for all of our panelists. I will go through several of them and then return it back for a couple of questions as well. Uh, these are in no particular order, and I do want to uh, invite those looking in to share uh, their thoughts or ask their questions. We have a quite robust list here. Uh, in no particular order, but perhaps, Dave, I'll go back to you because we started with you. Uh, one question is, uh, what do you think is the first or second order diplomatic challenge over the next decade in the Antarctic? Uh, there's other related parts to that. Is it MPAs? Is it thinking about setting up the next phases of the Antarctic Treaty? Uh, there's a number of layers in there, but what are one of two of the, the biggest diplomatic challenges in the Antarctic region? Thanks, it's a great question. Um, the Antarctic regime is actually reasonably stable. It doesn't mean there aren't challenges in and about it, but compared to the Arctic, for example, which is uh, still very much an evolving regime, the Antarctic system has been in place as we have it today for really quite some time. Um, once the pandemic subsides, the challenge of managing increasing tourism, particularly to the peninsula, but also elsewhere in the continent will has, has been a challenge, it will continue to be a challenge. That would be one thing. <laughs> Excuse me, a second one has to do with managing the living marine resources around the continent. Uh, Camelar um, has had the reputation of being sort of one of the um, most science-based and least politicized of the various organizations that do these things, different parts of the planet. Of late though, it's had its own problems and certainly during the pandemic, uh, it's hard to get stuff done, uh, but pressure on uh, the stocks and uh, other creatures that live in the oceans around Antarctica are growing and there will need to be more attention to that. Um, I'm not one who's particularly worried about geopolitical problems in Antarctica, but of course we must be vigilant to make sure that the prohibitions on military activities and, uh, and other, other things that we wouldn't want to see in Antarctica are adhered to. And so I'd say that would be a third challenge, keeping the regime stable and peaceful. Thank you. Uh, let me move on to a question for Kelly, a uh, two part. Uh, and I'm just going to read this, Kelly, straight out. How do the various research programs carried out or funded by the National Science Foundation interact with other government agencies, in particular, the Department of Energy? And how might those relationships and partnerships be improved? Uh, so, as I noted, we are charged with being the single point coordinator on behalf of all of government. So baked into our responsibilities at NSF is to pull in all of the other agencies and we do have extensive um, participation by NASA scientists, NOAA and so forth. Um, with respect to the Department of Energy, we've had multiple projects over time. Um, and I, I would point out that we've also tried to think about how we might take advantage of renewables because having to transport fuel to Antarctica is, is its own special challenge. So for example, we've, we've worked with the Department of Energy to uh, try out electric vehicles and collect data so that they can better understand uh, the challenges and, and opportunities there. Um, but we've also worked with the Department of Energy on, on science matters. Uh, they have what they call ARM. It's a radiation monitoring uh, portable system we've deployed to Antarctica. How would we improve? Um, that's a good question. I, we're always open to improvement. That's part of our mindset. Um, so I think really hearing more from the practicing science community to their program officers helps uh, my program officers work with them to bring things to the fore. Uh, and, and, and this really applies both to the science being done and operational matters, particularly with the Department of Energy. I should say Thank one more thing um, about that. 
we do have an extensive investment in renewables with our partners in New Zealand. And they have, uh, this is an unusual thing, they help to capitalize a three wind turbines that generate a megawatt of wind power. It's a fairly impressive operation given how remote we are on the planet. And it actually functions even better than we thought it might based on preliminary testing. Um, we are embarked on overhauling our station. And when we diminish our footprint and make it more efficient, um, at just about the same time, our New Zealand partners will be um, refurbishing that. And we expect to have threefold the power production through their refurbishment effort because the technology's gotten so much better. So, so um, we, we have those kinds of um, collaborative arrangements for operations and science internationally as well. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, John, I have a question, a number of questions for you, but let me try to boil it down here to a very simple question, which is, which is what is next? Uh, how, how are you going to advance what you just shared with us uh, to um, obtain answers to the questions that you see facing your community in order to help us understand better our entire universe? Now, realize I've just condensed about five questions into one. Well, I, um, um, yeah, I'm not sure which one of those five I should, uh, I should take out of there. Uh, so we're, we're just really excited about uh, uh, how far the whole program has come in the last few decades. And, and where we are right now is, you know, we're imaging this early universe and, and um, you know, looking at it and, and everything seems to be working. We, we know how to build um, these detectors, which are limited only by the, the noise they detect, not by generating their own noise, you know, by the atmosphere. We uh, have found that the atmosphere of the pole is extremely stable, so it allows us to make these measurements. Uh, 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 we've learned that we can look through our own galaxy. There's a clear enough view of our own galaxy. I mean, we're in a galaxy, we have to be able to look out of it. So there's a window out of our galaxy and it's visible from the South Pole. So everything is go, go, go. Uh, and so the trick now is, okay, well, we, we can calculate how long it's going to take. We take our own experiments here to get to a limit where we'll either be able to tell you all that, that uh, our universe inflated. We can really test that theory or tell you, no, you know, uh, this is a little different than we thought and we've got to get our thinking caps on and, uh, and or we'll learn about uh, dark energy and dark matter. And maybe, you know, it, it's kind of like a hundred years ago with, with quantum mechanics, all this phenomena out there and we didn't quite know how to put it all together. Uh, then we figured it out and now we have lasers and all sorts of great stuff. So it's a real exciting time. Uh, and we'd like to get there, some of us in particular, not in 50 or 100 years from now, but maybe in uh, you know, five or 10, 15 years. And so to do that, we've got to, we have to get more detectors on the sky. We've got to, we want to speed this up. We know the target, we know the technology. So, so what we're doing is uh, we're going to figure out how to do mass production of these detectors, how to build telescopes that have much, much more throughput so that we can get to our goals quicker. And that really is the name of the game. That's what we're talking about. Uh, for this project, which we call CMB uh, S4. We have a, a new telescope that will uh, take over where the South Pole 10 meter has taken over. It has essentially about 20 times more throughput. So it's building that stuff we want to do next. And we have the students, we have uh, the brain power, we have the technology. Uh, you're just eager to get and, and John, you have DOE partnership, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, and we're partnering with the Department of Energy. In fact, the South Pole Telescope, which I showed in that detector array, was done uh, with the Department of Energy, uh, with Argonne, uh, a Fermi Lab, Slack, and Lawrence Berkeley Labs, all working with us. Thank you, thank you, John, for navigating. Thank you for navigating that nest of of questions all in one. I appreciate that. Uh, Captain, as you might imagine, we have a number of questions for you. Uh, some have to do with um, uh, your, the support that you provide in the Antarctic, but more questions coming in about your note of sovereignty, projecting sovereignty in the Arctic. Uh, and many individuals would like for you to perhaps explore that a little bit more. Let me just read part of a question to you. When you refer to the Arctic and the U.S., 
projecting its sovereignty. What do you actually mean by that? And why would you want to project sovereignty in the high seas or international waters? No, of, of course not. And, and please don't, don't misinterpret my, my comments as any sort of overreach. I, I'm talking about the fact that the U.S. is an Arctic nation and, and we have territorial seas uh, and an exclusive economic zone uh, surrounding Alaska that has been largely neglected for many years because of the Coast Guard's limited capacity and ability to provide presence in that region year round. Th this is an opportunity for the United States to pay some attention to that area, uh, given the opportunity that we have here with the circumstances in Antarctica not requiring ice breaking services this winter. Uh, we're going to, to go up and operate in our exclusive economic zone and territorial sea and provide that presence on the surface uh, that has been missing for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you for the qualification. Marisol, just a heads up, I'm going to take it back to you for a question, then I have a few more. But, but Captain, another question uh, is, what will be the feedback loop from what you're going to learn this winter? And how will be the feedback loop and how will you inform and influence perhaps what happens with the future uh, polar security cutters? How will the lessons learned translate into either design or operations uh, for future cutters? Absolutely. The, the Coast Guard uh, at Coast Guard headquarters, as well as at the Pacific area offices in Alameda, California, that is responsible uh, for the Western Arctic, are very hard at work right now designing a concept of operations for employment of the polar security cutter once it comes online. We're, we're looking into and examining the different opportunities for what presence looks like and, and what a rotation of vessels is as well as the long tail of logistics that will be required to support that. Not, not just the mechanical support and, and the, the boats and the helicopters and, and the, the UAVs that will support it, but also the training and, and the human capital that goes into operating those vessels in that environment. Right now, we're, we're sort of at a wasp's waist in terms of Coast Guard and United States uh, polar icebreaking capability. We're, we're down to two icebreakers, the, the Healy and the Polar Star, um, with, with a very difficult maintenance requirements that are, are keeping us at the dock to keep us running and sustaining the vessel so that we can be operational and, and able to respond to those requirements in theater. Um, and as a result, there's a very small cadre of individuals in the Coast Guard uh, that are ready and familiar with these operations in these areas. And so we're taking steps to ensure that we build a huge group of folks that can respond to that call as we build two or three heavy icebreakers and then potentially medium icebreakers to follow that. Thank you for, for that very much. There's some more questions. If we have some time, we'll get back to them related to that. But Marisol, we have a number of questions about uh, shape and design of regimes, governance regimes, both in the Arctic and Antarctic. And perhaps I'll, I'll ask you to, to uh, follow that line of questioning. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so Ambassador Bolton, I was hoping that um, you could, um, so as you explained, there's a global treaty that governs activities in Antarctica that has been quite successful. And some people have suggested uh, a global treaty for the Arctic but there are significant differences between the two poles that may justify a different approach. And so I'm hoping that you could elucidate upon some of those significant differences, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, thanks, Marisol, I can try. Well, it was particularly fashionable in some circles about 15, 20 years ago to advocate for a kind of treaty for the Arctic comparable to the Antarctic Treaty, in part because the Antarctic Treaty, the treaty system has been quite successful. But uh, it hasn't come about, and for some good reasons. One key difference, of course, is that unlike in Antarctica, uh, there are no territorial disputes in the Arctic. Every piece of land, at least above sea level, is recognized to be part of one of the eight Arctic countries. Yeah, there's one island that Canada and Greenland slash Denmark both claim that's not a significant issue. Um, there also are people who live in the Arctic permanently. Um, some 4 million people north of the Arctic Circle. There is no permanent population in Antarctica. Another big difference, of course, is that while in the 1950s, uh, the countries who signed the treaty and all those that have joined since have been willing to keep Antarctica demilitarized as such, 
The Arctic is not demilitarized. It was a focal point of the Cold War. And even since then, there are military activities, installations uh, in the Arctic. That's not going to change. Um, but what we have seen instead in the Arctic over the last decade is a series of sectoral agreements designed to uh, strengthen cooperation in particular fields in the Arctic, um, one on search and rescue, one on oil pollution, one on uh, enhancing science. The IMO's Polar Code came into force. There's a fisheries agreement for the Central Arctic Ocean. And so combined, there is a kind of regime evolving for the Arctic. It's not quite the same type of regime as we have for the Antarctic, but maybe it's actually a better fit for the circumstances that exist on the top of the planet as opposed to the bottom. Thank you, Dave. I think you just answered a number of questions we had coming in. Uh, I'd like to go back to uh, some other questions here. Kelly, uh, we have a few questions about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, the research that will be conducted in Antarctica this coming season. Can you comment on that? Uh, yes, I can. Um, and if anybody really wants to check, um, we also post on the website that NSF runs for the Office of Polar Programs, uh, this, the announcements in detail on this. But, but basically, COVID-19 cannot be introduced to Antarctica. You can imagine in, in cold facilities, and you know this better than anyone sitting in Alaska, you, you ha would have a hard time containing spread. And so we don't have the medical capabilities to deal with that in Antarctica. That any kind of outbreak could be the demise of, of a lot of people's lives. And so with that in mind, we knew that we needed to be very careful about avoiding the introduction of COVID writ large. I am currently chairing a group called the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs, which is one of the groups that the treaty body recognizes as um, having collective expertise on how to operate in Antarctica. And we agreed, we got a pledge together way back in March saying that, you know, we, we will collectively work hard to avoid that. Um, so in order to do that, um, and yet, keep our programs going at, at a minimally required sustainment level. Um, we've had to devise a lot of um, protocols and practices and, and uh, my team has been uh, intensely involved in trying to prioritize the things that will allow us to keep those three stations running, the ones we're obliged to. They were not designed to go cold. We can't just walk away from them or they would you know, basically be, be lost. Similarly, you saw some of the um, infrastructure that Dr. Karlstrom showed. We can't walk away from that either. So, so we had to look very carefully at what, what are the things that we need to do and those things are being taken care of. We've dialed back to roughly a third of our normal deployment numbers in order to, to, um, to do these priority things. That does create a situation where a number of activities are deferred. Uh, so, so that's where we sit right now. Um, and I wanna say that um, it's a combination of the ice conditions and this COVID situation that caused us to decide to do an air operations only resupply. That's a little bit of a misnomer because there's still a marine component to it. Every year we have a cargo vessel come down to the station and deliver supplies that then get distributed to South Pole um, at McMurdo Station. That's why we need the icebreaker. It has to break a channel into the station. And then uh, almost um, every year until recently, we would need a tanker for fuel as well. But we've upped our ability to store fuel. So we really don't need to supply fuel every year. We weren't planning to supply fuel anyway this year. But we did, um, we will have to move our cargo largely to New Zealand and then fly it down. Um, we're going to need the Coast Guard back next year. <laughs> so we're very much uh, looking forward to Bill taking good care of the ship as he goes north with her <laughs> and, uh, and, and look forward to working very closely with the Coast Guard on the very important resupply next year. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so let me, let me segue back to Bill, but but I do have more for the other panelists. I'm 
we're watching notes. We've got about 10, 12 minutes left. Uh, Captain, uh, a number of questions here. I'm going to try to augment it a little bit. So how is the Department of Defense uh, changing and adapting its stance in the Arctic? So I think we could just maybe insert there, how's the United States uh, changing and adapting its stance in the Arctic? And how does the Coast Guard's efforts with the Polar Star's presence relate to that of both the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense? Basically, I think it's how does your mission and your mission sets of the Coast Guard fit into a broader U.S. Uh, posture in the North? Absolutely. We're working under a number of foundational documents and strategies. All the different branches of the Department of Defense are working on or, or have recently published their own Arctic strategies. But ultimately, the Coast Guard's purpose up there is to fulfill our operational mandates uh, in, in terms of safety, security, and stewardship. Um, there's a considerable need for us to demonstrate that capability and, and that projection in that presence in theater, particularly during that difficult time of year, is a great uh, opportunity for us not only to practice and, and exercise our ability to operate there, um, but also to show to the rest of the world that this is important to us and that we are not giving up on the theater or, or the Arctic writ large. Thank you. Have a Another couple of questions for any of the panelists who would like to take this, <clears throat> do this in, in not necessarily any order. order. Uh, first question is, do the US geopolitical needs in the Arctic take priority over Antarctic logistics? Who would like to tackle that one? So I get asked that kind of thing a lot. And, and uh, you know, I have a bipolar purview here in the Office of Polar Programs. What I would like to say is it's, it, when people are asking that question, they're often asking it with a mindset of a zero sum game, that there's a pot for us to do polar things and then it, it has to be divvied up. Um, I don't think of it that way. <laughs> I think, you know, as, as has been nicely described here, the circumstances uh, geopolitically, operationally and otherwise are very different at the two poles. And I think the U.S. has very strong prerogatives in both regions. And I personally, you know, speaking for the research side of the house, uh, see both polar regions as a treasure trove of discovery that matters to humanity everywhere. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it, it's a matter of one pole takes precedence over another. I do think we do need to pay appropriate atten attention to both poles and make sure that we are really truly. Um, staffing and you know um, provisioning and getting the assets in play that need need to be in play for us to do that from the coast guard perspective we absolutely have an enduring commitment to usap and providing those ice breaking services to support their program um, and i think that we're on the right path with our acquisition plan and the program of record to build polar security cutters by the end of the decade we're going to have the capacity uh, to operate year-round in both regions as needed. Thank you. Uh, Dave, John, any comments related to that? If not, I'll move on to the next question, which I think will be open to all I think, of you. I think, I think uh, Kelly and Bill said everything that needs to be said. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, is, is asking, can someone speak to the growing Chinese engagement in the Antarctic? There's a number of their future, their current and future research stations planned. Um, uncooperative behavior at the recent Camelar meeting. Uh, basically, the overall, what's, what's, what are your perspectives about China in the Antarctic, uh, their motives, motivations, uh, and, and the uh, ability to partner with them? Well, I could start, but I, uh, I don't have a full picture of, of this. Um, for one thing, China is hardly the only country that is creating a larger presence for itself in Antarctic. In recent years, for example, Korea has also expanded its research capabilities um, uh, in and around Antarctica. So it's not just China. That's one thing. Um, secondly, the, the people who tend to ask me that kind of question uh, seem to believe that there is something necessarily nefarious in what China is trying to do by expanding its capabilities in and around, in and around Antarctic. To the extent they are focused on science, 
I don't actually see that. I see yet another uh, country wanting to do more science in, in Antarctica and potentially a, a partner on certain si scientific activities with us or others. Um, it is true that in many places in the world, China is as a sort of emerging global superpower seeking to expand its influence in some ways, including some ways that are um, adverse to US interests. That is certainly true in many other parts of the world. Um, at least for me, while I would be vigilant uh, about Chinese activities in Antarctica, I haven't yet seen any serious conflict on the horizon just yet. In Kamalar, we, we had a very frustrating meeting of Kamalar, all virtual, as you might expect, just in the last couple of weeks. And a number of things that um, the United States and other countries had hoped to get done at the meeting uh, did not happen. I don't know that China was um, entirely to blame for that. But to take one example, uh, there were a number of uh, proposals for additional marine protected areas around uh, Antarctica that once again were not adopted. They would need to have been adopted by consensus and there was not consensus. And China is one country, not the only one, that has some reservations about these proposals. Um, maybe next year, they'll go through. Anyway, uh, it's at least in Antarctica, it's not quite as um, worrisome to me as uh, the question would seem to imply. And Mike, perhaps I can offer a, an anecdote or a, a data point. I, I was lucky enough to be part of the inspection team led by the State Department and NSF this year that, that visited uh, the brand new uh, Chinese station at Inexpressible Island. And we saw there a, a new facility that was very much uh, in, in the growing phase. We, we observed nothing untoward, no violations of the treaty. Uh, the report came out and I, I think folks will find some recommendations there. Um, but most of all, the, the kind of takeaway for us was just how new it was. And, and the fact that this was a, a, a very nascent section for them that they were expanding into and still very much trying to figure out. There was a lot of learning and growth going on, um, but nothing that would indicate any sort of untoward or nefarious activities. I've seen some people say, you know, if, if, if we're backing off on, for example, our presence in Antarctica or others are backing off on their presence under COVID, it opens up the door for more nefarious activity or whatever, in, in, at least in some people's speculative minds. But I would say that, you know, through Comnap, we do have to report to each other uh, our activities and everybody pretty much is dialing back um, out of necessity and China among them will slow some of its, you know, planned activities, including construction of an inexpressible island as a result of the challenges we face in the global situation. Um, so, you know, again, I think some of that speculation is is headed in a direction that doesn't have any um, evidence to suggest that it's actually happening. Thank you. We have about three minutes left. So let me again try to condense a number of questions uh, in, in a way that you each can respond to it as a wrap up. I guess the, the summary of all of them are the following. It, it, give us, give the audience one priority that you would like to see advanced in your particular uh, either organization or your particular work. That's related to other questions, which is how can we as the public or policymakers help support your work? So if you had to pick one or two things that the public should know or that could perhaps advance advocacy what might those one what might that one thing be or those things be uh, Dave maybe I could just start with you we'll go we'll go through the order there oh boy um, I guess I would say for at least for my set uh, to the public please learn more about Antarctica the program like we had today and many others like it um, tell an amazing story about it's truly an extraordinary place with also an amazing history over the last uh, 100 years, 200 years and since. Uh, there's a rich literature and there's amazing stuff going on as uh, uh, John Carlson, Carlstrom uh, explained, Kelly did as well. Learn about it, support it. Um, that is my message to you. Thank you, Dave. Kelly? 
I think as I started off saying, I really appreciate the Wilson Center doing this event because I feel sometimes like it's a best kept secret. And I feel like, you know, everybody should be super proud of it. I, I kind of wish there were little red parkas uh, hanging in every airport like you see the NASA jumpsuits because I feel like if people understood the program more, they'd all want one. Um, there are reasons we can't do that. But in any event, um, I do feel like what Dave said is right on uh, to the extent that we can, from the National Science Foundation standpoint, make it clear to the, to the public and provide materials and uh, allow access for people to learn more about it. You know, it's, it's something that we're committed to. Perfect, Kelly, thank you. And, and related to that, we've been asked several questions about what else will the Wilson Center do to help these kind of conversations. And I can commit to that. I mean, 2021, you will see a whole lot more coming from us uh, on this and many other related issues to the Antarctic. So we'll look forward to, to advancing those. John, let me provide for you an opportunity. Well, I, I would uh, second what David and Kelly said that, um, you know, we're doing great stuff, learn about it. Uh, and, um, you know, we, NSF, DOE also with our work, they're supporting it. No, these agencies are helping help, help Help the government help these agencies. They're they're doing great stuff, and it's helping, uh, uh, you know, giving us answers to age-old questions, but also providing the technology to face today's problems. So, get involved, learn about it, and um, help me build the next telescope while you're at it too. <laughs> I, I was waiting for that, uh, and if you didn't do it, I was going to do it for you. Uh, and let me also do it for 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 Captain as well. Uh, we, we certainly support and thank you support your mission and thank you for the service you and your crew and and your colleagues so let me let me give you the opportunity before i turn it over to marisol for maybe her last her last thoughts captain absolutely thanks mike you know i've got a 135 hard-working men and women that, that really uh put service before self they, they come to the ship and, and we're away from home sailing to the ends of the earth for four or five months a year and then spending a lot of time in dry dock fixing the ship. You know, it, it's it's old and it takes a lot of work to keep this ship running, um, but their hearts are in it. And, and we individually and as a service are absolutely committed uh, to the, the US policy goals in the Arctic and the Antarctic. These are very special places. They're very different, but there are threads that tie them together. And from a Coast Guard perspective, anything that we're able to do in one carries over and has synergies that really inform the other. So this is a terrific opportunity um, for all of the US government uh, to pay attention to not just one or the other, but look for ways that we can make investments that will serve our national interests in both regions. Thank you, Captain. Uh, and before now, I'll turn it over to Marisol in a second. But Captain, thank you very much for joining us today. When you are done with your expedition, and you're, you're back on dry land, uh, we want to invite you back in 2021 uh, to explore what it is that you have done on your, your mission north and good luck to you and your crew. Dave Bolton, thank you very much as always for your insight. John Karlstrom, extraordinary research and work been done by you team and Kelly, thank you so much for leading the office that you lead but also providing some a really important perspective on our work uh, in, the, in the Antarctic. Marisol, let me leave it to you to wrap this session up. And I thank you once again for crafting this for us today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And I'm so grateful to each of the panelists for uh, participating today and presenting on your unique perspective uh, on Antarctica. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that really stands out to me is just that the cooperation that's required to make all of these efforts successful is really inspiring. And I think it's really something to um, just recognize with all of the other challenges that are going on in the world right now. And so I want to thank each of you for your contributions in, in that way as well. Um, and then I also just want to mention that on usap.gov, you can link to Antarctic research webcams if you would like to uh, kind of keep tabs on what's happening there. And then on December 2nd, Polar Star will be deploying north. And so I would encourage you to follow them as they head up to the Arctic. So thank you so much again. Really appreciate everything and have a great day.